arrived here in Silicon Valley through a series of chances. One thing that I wanted to do was to find a way as a geek to come to what essentially was geek heaven. It was quite some time ago, so I took a leaf out of Daniel's book and broke the rules. Rather than printing up a t-shirt, I printed up a thing like that with my resume on it, went over to University Avenue in Palo Alto and just handed at lunchtime and just handed it out to anybody who looked like they might work in the tech industry. Through a sequence of events, I ended up getting a job which led to another job and that led to a startup. We did some interesting stuff for a little while and eventually the founders decided to sell the company and they made a whole lot of money and the rest of us got to pay off our car loans. And I had a bunch of friends who were at SRI and they said, you really need to come and play with us, come work. So SRI is a large uh, research institute here in Menlo Park. There's about 2,000 people spread across the country in different labs. We do all sorts of different sorts of research in uh, a variety of different disciplines. We like to, to integrate across disciplines. So bring people in from different areas, mix up their ideas and see what comes out of it. Siri comes out of the Artificial Intelligence Lab at SRI. When I arrived there, the guys were working away, building up an intelligent assistant that would know who you are, know your identity, know your ideas and preferences, merge that with some speech recognition, and eventually they spun that out, turned it into a company called Siri, and a little while later it was acquired by Apple, and we know the story from there. In order for something like Siri to work, it needs to build up a set of preferences, a set of uh, information about who you are, what, you're, what you like, right, how you're connected, what your typical schedule is. And over time, it builds up a picture of you. It is your identity. It's, it's your, your assistant. Where it goes from here, and there's all sorts of interesting directions it might, it might go. That's sort of the, the past, the recent past at SRI. So there's some other stuff going on now, and I'll tell you a little bit more about what's going on, what might be coming down in the future. And then we'll end up with just a couple of uh, cautionary notes, if you will. Now, one of the projects that I'm working on at the moment is a study of people playing video games. People in massive multiplayer games express themselves in some form of identity. They have particular speech patterns or chat patterns. They particular uh, ways of uh, moving around the virtual world. They have preferences for certain types of avatars and avatar behavior. They want to be a, a tank versus a healer. And this, of course, is all driven by the affordances that the, the, that the game, the virtual world, offers you. Our partners have been bringing people into their labs and studying how players behave. So we're, we're doing we're work with a number of universities around the world, and we're bringing people into labs, into schools. We're watching people in cafes. It's all voluntary participation. Everybody knows what's going on. We're looking to see what behaviors identify people in multiple worlds. It's fine to be able to say, well, you know, this person has a particular identity in World of Warcraft. Well, how does that map to their corresponding behavior in a different, in a different virtual world? We, we see things like males play differently than females. The text chat that they use is, is different. Younger people play differently than, than older people. So we're working on building up a picture of, of what the typical player is based on the type of activity that they carry out in the virtual world. The goal, things like improved training systems, improved learning environments, if you can tailor what's going on in the, the experience that the person is having in the virtual world, if you can tailor it to what you understand are, the, are their typical preferences. This is something that's going on at the moment. We're about halfway through this project and we're finding some interesting results. It turns out that, that when you look across virtual worlds, the thing that's common that most that people carry from world, one world to another is actually their text chat. They tend to chat in the virtual world, pretty much the same from one, one world to another. Lots of other things are different, but that's one of the things that, that's very common. This is a world that we use, especially designed world for, for our purposes. The advantage of using something like that is that nobody knows how to play it when, when they come into the lab, because it's a, it's a new world, so everybody's starting from the same starting point.
when you look at biometrics, this is a, another piece of work that's, that's going on at our uh, research facility in Princeton. A variety of types of biometrics can identify you. As we were talking earlier, things like facial recognition, voice recognition, the, the gait that you have. Iris on the Move is a, a product that comes out of our Princeton lab where essentially they are looking at your, your, your eye rather than having to go up and squint at something so that it can read you. It's reading from a distance. And as you move through an environment, as you move through a, a security checkpoint or you need entry to, some, to somewhere, the system reads the quality of the video camera is sufficiently good that you can start picking out the details of a person's iris. And the irises are different, obviously, from one person to another. It's a more reliable way of identifying people than, uh, than fingerprints. That's a little product that's uh, sort of coming down the pike. This is an area where we're collaborating with some, some universities to understand from people's movement what it is that's unique about them. We were talking earlier about the difference between content and form. The name is John Hancock, but it's the signature. That's the important thing. You know what's being written, but the, everybody brings their own characteristic to writing a signature. How is the, the memory of that signature encapsulated in the human brain? You build up some sort of a habit over time. You practice something and you build up a habit. You get used to writing your signature in a particular way. So if you wanted to make a little bit stricter about this and you wanted to use some movement as a way to authenticate yourself to a system or as a way to define a password for encrypting your email, you could learn some skill. You could spend a couple of hours learning how to play a guitar or learning to play a particular piece on a piano or some other sort of physical behavior and encode that into the brain. As you, as you learn, then a few days later, you, uh, you need to authenticate. You get played the beginning of the tune and you continue playing along. And somewhere in that tune is your unique signature. The big advantage is that you don't know where it is. You just basically say, oh yeah, I recognize that tune, I'm going to play in a particular way. Or I recognize that dance pattern, I'm going to dance in a particular way. And we're just starting to, to find out how much information, how much, what's, what's the size of the, of the password that can be encrypted in this way and uh, are provided in this way in a... Um, in a reasonable, reasonable fashion. We're not asking people to become virtuoso violinists here. Just something that you can learn over a few hours, some particular pattern of, of, of activity that will become automatic, just like writing, writing a signature. So we're starting to look at that. We're collaborating with a couple of, uh, as I say, with a couple of colleagues, at, uh, some at Stanford and at uh, Northwestern University. And the idea is that you know, these, sorts of, these sorts of tools can be used as a way to, to identify yourself to a secure system. Go to braincrypto.com and we'll, you'll, you'll see what we're, what we're getting at. It's a very simple abstract game. The balls fall down and you have to type the following sequences on the keyboard predicting where they're going to fall. Over time, it'll speed up and you have to catch up. Or if you, if you start making too many mistakes, it'll slow down again. It takes about an hour and you learn that sequence. And come back a week later and, and get tested on it. But the test takes about 10 minutes. And I think you get paid $10 on Mechanical Turk if you, if you participate. So that's in the works. If we go further, down, down the road a little bit. This is a new program, Active Authentication, that has recently been announced by one, at a, uh, one of the funding agencies at the, in the US government. And their goal is continuous authentication, continuously identifying who you are to a system, whether it's Siri or some other computer system. What sorts of patterns of behavior just on your normal ways of interacting with the, with the system, what sort of patterns identify who you are. There's physical aspects like your, your iris or your fingerprint, the type of interaction, keystrokes, mouse movements, and so on. Then you start looking at some of, some of the text, semantic structure. When you're typing a document, you, you bring your 
personality to the writing of that document and how you use language. So looking up that, that architecture, the idea is to find ways that as a person is continually working with a, interacting with the system, are you really sure that this person is still the same, same person? Siri would be, would be a good example of that. It, it can measure your gait as you're moving around. It, when you take it out, it can look at your eye. There's the more that you can authenticate, you, the computer, can authenticate the human who's using it, the more you can do that, then the, the safer and securer these systems become. Now, there's downsides to this, of course. When you conduct research with, with human subjects, since I think the early 70s, there have been a set, set of guidelines as to what sort of research is permitted using human subjects and what sort of information do they need as participants, do they need to be aware of. Their participation has to be absolutely voluntary. You have to give them informed consent that they know what they're being studied. This is kind of typical for medical studies, for psychology studies, anybody's participation, these sort of things. That's absolutely standard. You need to maximize the benefits that the participants get and minimize the harms. These are, these are general rules that, that ethics committees deal with all the time. And everybody has to be treated fairly. You, don't, you can't bias your study towards one population versus another. So this is all fine. This, we know how to do that since the 1970s. The problem is now that because of the amount of uh, monitoring and tracking of in information about people as you interact with systems, as you interact with each other through various systems, there's enormous, as we all know, there's enormous amounts of information that's being gathered about you with sometimes very little respect for the protection of their people's identity, their anonymity and security and so on. People are not taking this sort of thing into account anywhere near as much as perhaps they should. There's, because you're looking across jurisdictions, it's a completely different plan here when you're looking at people playing games, for example, on the net. Not all these people are subject to, to US legislation, and other countries have different requirements, either, either more strict or less strict. And the other big thing is, well, who owns this data? When you spend a lot of your effort putting material into, into your Facebook page or leveling up your character in World of Warcraft, you own that in some sense. But the end user license agreements and all of those pages of legal mumbo jumbo that you say I accept at the beginning, that doesn't say that. And most people don't take any, any account of what's there. That's what, at the moment, counts for informed consent. You were told that anything you put onto Facebook belongs to the company and not to you. You were told that. You were, that's informed consent. But you just said accept and went through. That's not ethical. People are not paying attention. They're taking these ancient rules from the 1970s and trying to apply them in an environment which is completely, completely different. We're doing our best to address these. New guidance has come out in the form of a new report which has just been published on the Federal Register and eventually will work its way into legislations, into ethics board guidelines and if you want to talk some more about it, I'll uh, be happy to point you at it. <laughs>